contrary to the theory of evolution, which is well argued, that scientists will get the Nobel Prize. They will be celebrated, glorified. There is nothing that we like more in science than finding an argument against something which is generally accepted. Of course, uh, science develops in a tentative way. Sometimes things which are tentative at the time become firm later. You know, I have been in the last few years working with uh, 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 parasitic protozoa, which causes diseases like malaria and chagas. I have turned around some of the general concepts that were accepted about how these parasites reproduce and how they live and how they function. Um, I, nobody has shut down my ideas. On the contrary, they are celebrated. Scientists want to have contrary ideas so long as the, they w uh, they are argued scientifically with good evidence and, and so that they can be accepted as scientific mm -hmm. ideas. Uh, and can I follow with a specific example of, from vertebrate paleontology? I work in a laboratory. Most of my time is spent doing theology, but I still do some evolutionary work on evolution of teeth and jaws. Um, I'm in the laboratory with Mike Caldwell, the chair of biology at the University of Alberta, and he's a mosasaur specialist, which is an aquatic reptile specialist. And there was a conference um, in Iowa a number of years ago, and Marcus Ross, who was a young earth creationist from Liberty Baptist University, uh, was giving a, a presentation. And Mike is, Mike, Mike's, Mike's a non-theist, and Mike point blankly said, and I saw the email, that Marcus will be allowed to present his ideas and that he didn't want any disrespectful rhetoric with regard to that. So to say that they're not given the opportunity, I mean, he didn't convince anyone. In fact, he didn't engage on it. There were a few people asked questions, but it didn't go much fr from that. So like uh, uh, Dr. Ayala says, you know, scientists would like, put it this way, Jeannie, wouldn't you love to find a human molar down in the Cambrian? <laughs> I mean, let's say you and I that want a really, human, really uh, uh, that's right, no, if, if we found a human molar down in the Cambrian, and this is what a word of exaggeration. We'd turn all of science upside down, wouldn't we? I mean, <laughs> we sure would. No. And, 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 and it's not like it would be hidden. I mean, uh, and there's the, the scientific community is massive. And I guarantee if there was that one human molar down there, it, be e everyone would be there. And the books and the money behind that, I hate to be cynical, the money behind that would be spectacular. <laughs> you know, just, just to shift things a little bit, I think a lot of the problem with religious opposition to evolution really is religious opposition to the idea of being able to explain things through natural causes. And it's really misunderstanding what science is all about. And we keep hammering away at, we're trying to explain the natural world using natural causes. That's true of cell division. That's true of explaining Chagas disease or parasites. And what it's true of explaining uh, how to straighten teeth. That, that's, that's true of all of science. But when people try to explain the origin of all living things on Earth and how we got this lovely diversity of creatures and where human beings came from and our relationship to other organisms, when you try to explain that kind of thing by reference to natural causes, that's when people get all upset. Well, and, um, and they shouldn't, you know, because that's just the way you do science. I've often asked uh, conservative Christians who have come up and spoken to me after lectures, um, if we... because they always bring up the idea, well, you haven't discovered the origin of life, therefore evolution didn't happen, which is really not the case because even if we don't understand a step-by-step -step way of getting from inorganic chemicals to that first reproducing cell, we still have common ancestry. Once you get that cell, from then on it's evolution. And we're not dependent upon a natural origin of life for evolution. But what I say to them is, okay, let's just say two weeks from now, Let's say that somebody in a laboratory someday, someplace comes up with a really plausible series of events going from inorganic molecules to organic molecules to something that can reproduce to something that re can reproduce within a membrane, a first cell. Would that mean there's no God? And they'll say, of course not. That's the point. <laughs> <laughs> Just because you can explain something with natural causes doesn't mean there's no God. Dr. Lamoureux, let me ask you, you're the one here who currently teaches students, uh, some of whom come like that young girl who was an atheist, but some of whom are not. And they will see this evolution as an attack on their way of life. Well, you're, you're, you've teed it up for me. I teach exclusively science and religion. And if I had to describe the average student that came, comes into my class, it's a student 
who's got a religious background, a personal faith, and a good portion of them want to go to med school. <laughs> they want to go to the next program. They've got to go through the biology department, and they need a lot of A's to get to the next program. Mm -hmm. Evolutionary biology, sure, you've got the fossil record, but you want to know where the greatest evolutionary evidence is occurring. It's in that gentleman's discipline right there, genetics and molecular biology. So if I had to describe the average student, and I love these, these young men and women, they are compartmentalized, and I'm not dissing them, they compartmentalize for their own psychological safety. They're seeing the evolutionary evidence. On one hand, in the laboratories and in their, their university education, and they're, they're working hard at it to get their A's. They're having their Sunday morning experience, but in their Sunday schools, there's this be suspicious of evolution, but they've also got this faith. How do they do it? And you know what I find so amazing? And basically a 13-week course, I can show them, and again, not simply my position, a variety of different models of people who have done both the science and the theology and are very faithful to say, here's how you can do it. And so they can integrate. And they know intuitively they, want, they, don't, they don't want this compartmentalized worldview. And in simply 13 weeks, I read these papers, and I just, I know when I was their age, I could never process. They're, they're, they're absolutely brilliant. And they put it together. And they're basically doing it in the way that all three of us, and remember, I think what's great about this panel is, remember, Jeannie is a non-theist. And this makes sense to her categorically. And uh, uh, it can be done. Uh, Francis, uh, Francisco um, Ayala? There is uh, no reason why being a scientist should be incompatible with being a person of faith or accepting science being, uh, be, be compatible with accepting faith. As I said earlier, I think that one can be a source of inspiration uh, for the other. Mm -hmm. But I uh, want to go back to the uh, statement that I made in passing before you asked me or gave me the opportunity for it. That you know, with intelligent design, you have this problem of the imperfections. It's not imperfections. It's that in the world of life, there is dysfunctions, there is cruelty, there is uh, oddities. There, are, you know, parasites can only live by killing their hosts. So it seems like if somebody has to be a sadist to have designed that. Well, um, sometimes when I try to explain to people, including my students, when they ask me questions about this, well, but th that does not excuse God of uh, being you know, responsible for these things. If these things occur in the world, ultimately God, God has to be responsible. My, my view of that is that the, the theory of evolution, in fact, solves what the theologians call the theodicy problem, why there's this kind of evil in the world. Because cruelty, you know, when you have a troop of baboons, which usually is a group of females with a dominant male, and then many of the females are uh, breastfeeding the babies, if that dominant male is killed or dies or is removed by some other dominant male, the first thing that the new male does is to kill all the babies. Now, that is favored by natural selection because by doing that, the females go all into estros and then the male fertilizes them, and the babies are going to carry his genes. So any genes that move him to kill the babies will be favored by natural selection because they will multiply more. Um, so attributing you know, the design of organisms to God, to me, amounts to blasphemy. Now, some people say, well, but if, if God has not done it, it's still one step removed. I don't care with, with, they say that my explanation is, this is a, something has been said by William Dembski, it's like saying, the, the, the God is not responsible for the evil in the world because uh, y you say that he has not designed it, but he's the creator of the world. It's like a, a mugger that comes with mm -hmm. a wild dog and rather than kill, killing his victim, has the dog killing the victim. And that's not so because, you see, baboons are not moral subjects. Uh, parasites are not moral subjects. Uh, they cannot cause evil. So if the actions they do are not caused by an agent, specifically designed, then they stop being evil actions. They are just phenomena of nature. You know, are, there is no morality in the actions of a baboon or a parasite. 
So that eliminates 